By fighting Ebola, it shows that our diplomatic work is not just about talk, but also mutual cooperation. Your work has created a good image for the country. Where we are needed, we will be there, no matter how difficult the environment is. When China's foreign minister touched down in West Africa last week, it marked an extension of China's development initiatives on the continent. Sierra Leone, Liberia and Guinea are still recovering from the deadliest Ebola outbreak in history, but have already made great strides with China, proving its worth as a cooperation partner. So how will China-Africa ties strengthen in the post-Ebola era? And what is the significance of Wang Yi's West African visit? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Now, China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi has concluded a successful three-nation tour of West Africa. The Foreign Minister visited Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia, which are seeking to rebuild post-Ebola. Some statistics may help put the importance of Wang Yi's visit in perspective. Now, combined, Ebola will set back the economies of the three West African countries by $1.6 billion this year alone, according to the World Bank. Individually, this translates to $500 million for Guinea, $200 million for Liberia, and $900 million for Sierra Leone. Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia are also facing a funding gap of $700 million to rebuild damaged health systems and provide services until December of 2017. So what needs to be done? Now China is already taking the lead here. In his bilateral discussions with the leaders of the three West African countries, Wang Yi pledged China's commitment in helping rebuild the economies by focusing on public health, mining, energy, agriculture, fishing, infrastructure, and human resources. Now, the first stop on Foreign Minister Wang Yi's trip was Sierra Leone, where the Chinese government is planning a comprehensive program to help the country's recovery. The Foreign Minister says the priorities include revamping the country's airports as well as its health sector. From the capital, Freetown, CCTV's Robert Nagila filed this report. The first stop in one year's tour of the worst hit Ebola nations in West Africa. Almost 4,000 have died here since early 2014. The economy's been devastated. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of the People's Republic of China. And this was the Foreign Minister's chance to see firsthand the progress in beating Ebola and to hear from the Sierra Leonean president how the country plans to rebuild. On behalf of the government and the people of Sierra Leone, let me welcome you and through you thank the president of the People's Republic of China. Chinese medics have had a frontline role in combating Ebola here. It also supplied critical equipment, including a mobile testing lab, to first track diagnosis. Wang Yi says the main focus now is promoting economic growth and that there will be support for various sectors of the economy. On health, this will include research on tropical diseases, while the delayed $300 million Freetown Airport project will be given top priority. China will also make available more scholarship grants for human resource training. As the country rebuilds, the threat of Ebola is never far away. It's the rainy season here now, and the Rostel fears that the Ebola virus could thrive under these conditions. Perhaps a reason why, when lifting certain public emergency restrictions, the president cautioned his citizens by saying, we're not out of the woods yet. Robert Nagela, CCTV, Freetown, Sierra Leone. Now, the African Union has hailed the assistance of China in the battle against Ebola as a story of great success. African Union Social Affairs Commissioner Mustafa Kaloko said the African continent would also like to see China assisting in the formation and running of the Africa Center for Disease Control. The African Union and China both took a very direct intervention approach to the crisis of the Ebola virus. 
How significant were those initiatives in turning things around? Well, the partnership was already strong before this, uh, uh, the ASOA, you know, was set. But the important thing is that uh, China came in right at the beginning, at the time when we were just setting up the African Union support to the, the, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Uh, they supported us in two ways. One, they provided a lot of support to the ASEWA team itself. But then they also went on the ground in the, th in the three countries. Like in Sierra Leone, for, ex uh, for example, they established laboratories which were non-existent at the time, you know, increasing the, the resources that were needed on the ground at the time, which helped very much. They also sent experts, sent a lot of equipment at the time, which actually boosted the activities. Then they also helped us directly, apart from just the technical uh, aspect of it, we were helped financially in setting up what at that time was a very, very expensive procedure to which the African Union was new, because it was the first time we embarked you know, on a health uh, team to be sent. It was usually an issue of peace and security. So they supported us technically, as well as uh, material and financial-wise. Commissioner, what is the African Union's strategy now to prevent a repeat of this outbreak? Well, the strategy is, uh, one, uh, we really need to bring up the health institutions. We have to build, to strengthen the health institutions in the three countries, and for that matter, for the continent as a whole. That is one. Then our surveillance and preventive mechanisms also need to be boosted. And we are actually need to have a plan for humanitarian disasters in Africa, be it health, you know, any other crisis that borders on, on human disasters. We should have a plan so that we're not caught and we start doing things ad hoc. You know, we should have a plan before anything uh, comes on board. Uh, what role would the African Union want China to play in that strategy you've talked about? Well, let's take the, uh, one of the main uh, preventive and surveillance mechanisms that we are talking about, and that is it's the Africa Centers for Disease Control in which, again, we've had a lot of support you know, from uh, uh, the government uh, of China. Now, when this center is established, in the first instance, it, it will run on the issue of uh, emergency preparedness. You know, and that is, there will be an emergency operation center. You know, then it will also have, a, 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 what do you call it, call it, a center that detects outbreaks. You know? so, the, the, that, that's an epidemic base. The, 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 the way it's going to work is that when something starts anywhere, the center will pick it up and the, it will not be caught unawares. You know, so a kind of emergency preparedness. So those are the issues. Now, as we are saying this, China is already on the ground you know, in a, a number of those countries. Now, it's going to work in such a way that once the center is established, we expect from the government of China a lot of support in terms of facilitating the capacity of the member states to be able to report effectively to the center. You know, and this is a, it's a really where we want uh, China to help us in terms of the Africa CDC, the reporting system that comes you know, from the member states themselves. Before the outbreak of the Ebola virus, as you understand, the economies of Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone were thriving, and the activities, the economic activities there were uh, uh, relatively uh, going in the right direction. However, after the outbreak of the Ebola virus, things went back and now the economies of the three countries are, are, are in the mode of struggling. Now, how important is it that China's intervention is needed in helping the Western Africa region as a whole uh, in its journey to recovery? So one, what, what one has to uh realize here is that uh, these three countries were doing very well, as you stated yourself, in terms of uh, economic growth. And uh, after the epidemic, they lost quite a lot of uh, the impact they were going to have on, on uh, the, the growth uh, structure. Businesses were not running. You know, mining companies were not operating effectively. Industry was uh, seriously affected. Tourism was affected. So it is at this time that these countries actually need a lot of assistance from the major stakeholders who influenced you know, most of these uh, industries, this, uh, the tourist industry, and the uh, other means of uh, economic uh, output. So this is actually where we need 
big partners, you know, like China, the U.S., and all the, our usual trading partners to be able to assist the countries. The African Union is pushing for debt relief for the three countries. You know, we're moving towards that because really, you know, with the situation in which they are, uh, it, it will be very, very helpful if we relieve them of some of the external debt in terms of rebooting their economy. We're going to take a short break here, but when we come back, we'll have expert guests in studio to help unpack Wang Yi's visit to Africa. Stay with us. These facilities, which is described as the first international relief effort, that is something exemplary, and we want to commend China for this exceptional response. That was Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf applauding the Chinese cooperation received in response to the Ebola outbreak last year. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Now, to help unpack the significance of China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi's trip to West Africa, I have expert guests standing by in Nairobi, political analyst Professor Mashara Munene, and in Beijing, Beijing Current Affairs commentator Mr. Victor Gao. To you both, thank you for joining us on Talk Africa. Victor Gao, I'll start off with you now. China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi was in Africa this week, touring the Ebola-affected countries in West Africa. At first, it is the first, uh, he's the first foreign minister of a global power to tour West Africa after the Ebola pandemic. What is the significance, though, of this visit? I think uh, Prime, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi's uh, visit to the Ebola-affected countries is a very important landmark visit, mainly because people in those Ebola-affected countries need solidarity from the rest of the world. And Foreign Minister Wang Yi's visit demonstrates China's commitment to the people in that part of Africa, as well as China's devotion of resources to help the people to get out of the very difficult situation. And in China, because we also had a major epidemic of SARS back in 2003, we understand the importance of solidarity from people in other countries. Therefore, it is China's term to demonstrate our true commitment to the people in the Ebola-affected regions and China's willingness and readiness to continue to provide help to the people in that part of Africa for their continued growth going forward. All right, Professor Munene Masharia, though you're watching the foreign minister's visit here and you're watching Africa's reaction to that, uh, what uh, Mr. Victor Gao called solidarity, what did you take out of that meeting? What stood out for you? Well, uh, I agree with Victor Gao about the solidarity aspect. I think it was more a show of confidence when you have a very high-ranking government officer of a major power going to a place that's supposed to be dangerous in order to show the public, the people in Africa and elsewhere in the world, that West Africa is safe and people can go and do business, work, do whatever it is that has to do uh, to be done in order to get things working together uh, again. So it is a show of confidence, a uh, statement of practical support, uh, not just talk, but the reality of it, that it is actually necessary for people to be seen, to be engaging in a serious way to deal with the epidemic, 
which is now almost coming to an end, thanks to the concerted effort of well-wishers and uh, practical uh, operators like the Chinese government. Well, uh, Mr. Gao, though the foreign minister talked about poverty as a contributor to the outbreak of the disease, but he did also talk about uh, the kind of assistance that China was going to give uh, the, the countries post Ebola. What is it, though, that China wants to do, and why is China attaching importance to the post-reconstruction of the three countries? Well, I would say that these three African countries are very important as far as China is concerned, and we have very long-standing friendship between China and these countries. But this time, when the people in these countries are affected very profoundly by the outbreak of Ebola, they need sympathy, they need understanding, and they need solidarity from the people here in China. And Foreign Minister Wang Yi's visit to these countries will help him and the Chinese government and people in China to better understand the realities and the circumstances in these countries. And we can be more fine-tuned in delivering help and assistance to these people. And as I mentioned, because of our own SARS epidemic back in 2003, China now is better positioned to deal with major outbreaks of epidemics like that. And we have experience and track record to share with the people in the Ebola affected regions and countries. And I hope China and these countries can work together to not only deal with the consequences of the Ebola outbreak this time, but also to make sure that such epidemic no longer repeats itself going forward and the people will be better positioned in case of another outbreak. This is very important. China's help and international help for the people in these three African countries will be crucial for achieving sustainable development going forward in this part of Africa. All right, we'll look uh, briefly in a moment at the work that needs to be done now that the Ebola pandemic has been put in control. But the 2014 Ebola outbreak, though, in West Africa was the largest in history. And it will require a lot of determination and cooperation to rebuild the area. Now, earlier I spoke to Shams Syed. He is the program manager for African Partnerships for Patient Safety at the World Health Organization to find out more about the work that is required now. Um, certainly, um, each of the three Ebola-affected countries um, had a unique context before Ebola came. Um, and, of course, they, they have unique contexts today as well. Uh, we know very well that some of the countries, so for example, in Sierra Leone, that maternal mortality, childhood mortality was high before Ebola. But the shock of Ebola has had a profound impact on essential health services in each of these three countries. So we know that the level of trust in the, in the services has been affected. We also know that the level of utilization of the facilities, whether that be hospitals, whether that be primary healthcare facilities, whether that be outreach uh, mechanisms for immunization, all of those have been profoundly affected. We also know that um, health workers um, and, the, and the heroes and heroines of uh, the Ebola crisis, uh, we know that, the, that they have been affected both in numbers but also in morale. It's probably very um, important to emphasize that each of the three Ebola-affected countries have developed national plans for early recovery into long-term systems development. And each of these plans have been thought out comprehensively through the support of WHO and other partners and have been validated over the last few months while the Ebola outbreak has been um, rampant in West Africa. Um, the key now is to make sure that while we don't lose focus on Ebola and getting to zero and staying at zero, that we simultaneously take a, um, quite a significant um, input into the safe reactivation of essential health services in each of these three countries. And a huge amount of work has already been going on in different technical areas, whether that be infection prevention and control, whether that be health workers and how to um, bring back a, a group of health workers that are fit for purpose, both in the short term and in the medium term. But um, perhaps, most, perhaps uh, most importantly, how can we reactivate essential health services at the district level, at the county level, at the prefectural level in each of the three countries? So that's going to take a long time 
and the context that we had before Ebola has to be at the center of our efforts, but we cannot afford to ignore the wake-up call that Ebola has uh, provided for each of these three countries. Um, and at the same time, we cannot afford to ignore the wake-up call to the international community on how um, the international community comes together to support these countries. Of course, um, the Chinese role has been um, hugely significant in, in West Africa. Um, and when we look at the reconstruction effort, the biggest um, role that, I, um, that China may have is to support the early recovery and long-term health systems development plans that have been developed and validated by the countries. Each of these three countries now have these plans in place. And maybe one thing to consider is at the ground level, when these plans are um, implemented, at the district level or at the, or at the county level, when we're talking about health facilities, let's think about what the infection prevention and control mechanisms are within these facilities. All right, uh, Victor Gao in Beijing, uh, Professor Masharia Munena is still with us uh, here in Nairobi. Uh, Professor Munena, though, th this was really the first time that China had offered uh, assistance to a foreign country uh, as a result of a public health emergency. Uh, has this in any way changed the perception of China in Africa? Has it enhanced China's Africa ties? No, the image of China has in, uh, been enhanced in the sense that uh, it was not so much a question of what is it that the Chinese are getting out of it. It is the help that's coming at the time that it is properly needed and coming in a big way. The fact that China had been willing to send reportedly about a thousand health workers uh, into the, to the zone, uh, help to train people to deal with uh, health hazards, uh, the looking at different ways of lessening the likelihood of such outbreaks in the future. The image of China in this sense, in the fact that uh, many other countries have not volunteered uh, to do as much, can only be seen to be on the upward swing instead of the downward swing. So the image of China as going out of its way to help where the, when the need uh, arises is a very positive development for China and Africa in the way they relate to each other. All it right. is only a positive image that can come out of this. Uh, Mr. Gao, and that of course is the question being asked on the continent. What is it that China is getting out of its humanitarian assistance in terms of, of uh, its support in this public health emergency? Well, even though China today is already the largest, if not the second largest economy in the world, China remains a developing country. And there are many circumstances in China which are still very similar to those faced in many African countries. Therefore, China can really work very closely with African countries in terms of how to deliver the medical services, the drugs, the uh, expertise to the people in those countries, especially in inaccessible places, in remote areas, in rural areas, where the need for medical services will be even greater. And I would say that China back in the 1960s and early 70s already worked very closely with many African countries by sending out what we call barefoot doctors and uh, more recently I think based on China's rapid development we have greater capacities to deliver such services and track record and drugs etc to people in need in Africa therefore I would say in addition to developing major infrastructure projects, cooperation in commodities and resources, etc. China's cooperation with African countries in the public health sector, in sanitation, in setting up monitoring system, in disease prevention and uh, procure uh, uh, treatment, for example, will need to intensify in the years to come. And I think for these three African countries affected by Ebola, they need to regain confidence they need to regain trust and they need to really break out of this very difficult situation very quickly so that they can go back onto the path of development and achieving sustainable development will in its turn help these African countries to make sure that epidemics like this will no longer happen that profoundly affecting the livelihood 
and the safety of these people. And I think right. China will feel very honored and privileged to work closely with the African countries in this regard. Is this a policy, though, that China will be pursuing now, uh, moving forward? Because, as we mentioned earlier, this was the first time that China assisted uh, foreign nations in a public health emergency situation. Is this a policy that Africa will be seeing? China will be more engaged in uh, you know, public health emergency situations moving forward? Well, I would say that China actually already has very close cooperation with many African countries. Chinese doctors and medical workers, nurses, etc., have been working in many African countries in different teams, you know, providing medical services really down to the grassroots in these countries. This time, actually, when the Ebola out, uh, epidemic uh, broke out, uh, there are already Chinese medical assistants in those countries and later I think the Chinese government sending more uh, workers, more medical experts as well as drugs and treatment etc to help. So I hope going forward China and Africa can cooperate more on setting up such emergency response centers in different parts of Africa in storage of medical drugs for example and also other medical facilities so that African countries will be better positioned in the future to deal with an emergency case like this. All right. Uh, Professor Munene, though, uh, as we mentioned earlier, this has been a first for China uh, in terms of a public health emergency. What is it, though, that Africa would like to see from China? What kind of assistance would we like to see moving forward? I, th I think the Chinese are doing well so far, but uh, Africa would like to see more of it, more concerted joint efforts on training, uh, more of... Uh, knowledge imparting, uh, the infrastructure development that the Chinese are very good at. And uh, I think it, uh, just to go back a little bit to one of the questions you asked, what is China getting out of it? Of course, it is getting something about from here, uh, be it in terms of uh, satisfaction. And uh, China has this interesting uh, policy of one road, one belt. And uh, you cannot have a good belt or one uh, a good road if you have sick people around the world. So the strengthening the health sector, and because the healthy people make very good traders, very good uh, cooperators in various undertakings that China would like to to have, and Africa for its own uh, for the African purposes and interest, uh, relating uh, linking with China on health matters, on trade, on infrastructure on business is a very uh, lucrative way of looking at it for the future of the peoples who have a few things in common uh, based on their past. All right, uh, gentlemen, we leave it there for the moment. Uh, that's all we have time for this weekend. Thank you, my guests, for joining in the conversation in Nairobi, political analyst Professor Masharia Munene, in Beijing, current affairs commentator Victor Gao, and to you, my, our audience. Remember, you can join the conversation online through Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Please join us again next week for another edition of Talk Africa. From me, Beatrice Marshall. Goodbye.